Okay, well, hello and welcome everyone to the fifth in our six part global antimicrobial resistance webinar series. And today's webinar is entitled Developing Prescribing Guidelines. My name is Anghara Davis. I'm a medical microbiologist by background and clinical director for publishing and engagement for the Royal College of Pathologists. Almost a quarter of RCPATH's members and fellows are located outside of the UK. And the purpose of our webinar series is to provide an opportunity for our inter international members, wherever they may be in the world, to share experiences and good practice around antimicrobial stewardship in their respective regions of the world. So before we get into the presentations for this webinar, I just wanted to provide a quick overview of the series. We started uh, in early June and delivered a webinar every week, and that will continue until uh, Friday, the 12th of July next week. Uh, the, the pattern is that the webinars start with the UK speaker providing the introduction to the topic and outlining the UK perspective. And then we hear from our speakers from countries around the world. Uh, our, our final webinar next week will be uh, entitled Evaluating an Antimicrobial Stewardship Programme, What are the Measures of Success? And we will hear from country, country representatives from Canada, Egypt and Hong Kong. Here you can see the link to the College Conference webpage where these webinars are advertised. Uh, do remember that if you want to join each webinar, you need to register for each one individually via the web page. You can see the logo for the webinar there that says Global Antimicrobial Resistance Webinar Series. So this is the agenda for today's webinar, where the uh, topic introduction and UK perspective will be followed by presentations from Egypt and India. Uh, and I will introduce the speakers as we as we meet them. Afterwards, we'll have a Q&A session. So if you have any questions throughout the presentations, please uh, put them in the Q&A box as we go along, and we will aim to answer them all later in the session. We won't take the questions in between each speaker, but we will take them all at the end. So uh, to provide our topic introduction and UK perspective, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Sean Price and Zoe Kennelly. Sean Price is a specialist antimicrobial pharmacist working in Kumta Morgano University Health Board. And Zoe Kennelly is an antimicrobial pharmacist for Hoa University Health Board, working across both primary and secondary care, reviewing local prescribing guidelines, resistance data and auditing prescribing feedback. Uh, both of them uh, work on Welsh national work streams contributing to the antimicrobial stewardship agenda. So I'm very grateful to them both for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sean and Zoe. Uh, and over to you. I shall stop sharing my screen. OK, good morning, everyone. Um, and thanks for joining us today. As Ang Harrod's already said, our session is about developing antimicrobial policies and guidelines. And Ang Harris has also given you um, a little introduction of who we are. And you can just see from the map of Wales here, roughly where we work. So I'm at the bottom, uh, working in Cumtaf Morganog University Health Board in South Wales. And Zoe is working in Howellvar Health Board in West Wales. So I'm going to give an overview of antimicrobial guidelines and policies. And then Zoe's going to go into the specifics a little bit more about um, the UK perspective on things. So the aims of the, of the session then are for you to understand what antimicrobial guidelines and policies are, the differences between the two and why they're both important. And then we're aiming to help you develop the skills to start writing the policies and guidelines. Then to understand the processes needed to approve the policies and guidelines once you've written them and how to disseminate them to make sure they're used in practice. We're also going to talk about how to develop audits of the guidelines and how um, to understand the governance around review and maintenance of the guidelines once they're in place. 
So first of all, then, what is the difference between an antimicrobial policy and antimicrobial guidelines? A policy contains the principles that guide rational and prudent antimicrobial prescribing, whereas guidelines are much more specific and they contain antimicrobial recommendations for prescribing for specific infections. Why do we need antimicrobial policies and guidelines? They're a key component of our antimicrobial stewardship strategy, along with all these other constituents you can see in the diagram in front of you. So the development and implementation of antimicrobial policies and guidelines forms part of the UK National Antimicrobial Resistance Action Plan. And you can see on the right hand side here of your screen, the most recent version of this UK action plan. And this was put into place in response to the World Health Organization Global Action Plan on AMR. The World Health Organization Policy Guidance 2021 lists 12 interventions and activities grouped into five pillars. And these are important antimicrobial stewardship activities. You can see here highlighted in red under pillar one, the intervention is developed to develop national treatment and stewardship guidelines, standards and implementation tools. And in the and in the World Health Organization Practical Antimicrobial Stewardship Intervention Guide, um, this lists institution-specific guidelines for the management of common infections as one of the 10 most commonly used antimicrobial stewardship interventions. So why do we need policies and guidelines? They basically help us to use our antibiotics correctly and appropriately to ensure that patients are treated properly for their infections. They increase the use of narrow spectrum antibiotics, promote early IV to oral switch and a shorter antibiotic duration in general. All of these contribute to treating the patient effectively, limiting adverse effects, including Clostridium difficile, and reducing the emergence and spread of resistant infections, including multi-drug resistant infections, which in turn reduces morbidity and mortality due to these infections. And I'm sure we're all already aware that we need to preserve the effectiveness of our antimicrobials for the future by using them prudently now. So this slide just, just summarizes the benefits of antimicrobial guidelines. They improve patient care and patient outcomes, and they reduce costs. They also reflect local patterns of resistance, and they make sure the patient's getting the most appropriate treatment for the infection they've got. There's also evidence to show that they're an effective means of changing the behavior of antimicrobial prescribers. So an antimicrobial policy then, they'll all look slightly different, but will all contain the following key components. They'll have an introduction to explain the policy and a policy statement, a scope and aims. They'll contain the roles and responsibilities of everybody involved in antimicrobial stewardship. And then they'll contain some more specific principles. So for example, IV to oral switch principles, decision to treat principles and duration of treatment principles. And you can see at the bottom here in the yellow star, antimicrobial guidelines are one of the key components of an antimicrobial policy. In terms of the decision to treat part of the antimicrobial policy, this can be broken down further. So for example, there can be guidelines in there regarding review of acid suppression, use of the AWARE categories of antibiotics from the World Health Organization and some more specific principles of prescribing. So for example, checking allergies and taking cultures before antibiotics are started, 
starting antibiotics promptly when infection is suspected, and then using the guidelines to prescribe the most appropriate antibiotics while documenting the indication and the review date clearly. Antimicrobial guidelines then, as I mentioned earlier, are more specific than an antimicrobial policy. They're empirical treatment options for common infections, and they're based on evidence, local resistance patterns, the cost of the antimicrobials and their availability, which obviously will vary from place to place and country to country. They're designed to aid the clinician's diagnostic skills and not take away from their autonomy to ensure the patient is getting the correct antibiotic for their infection at the correct dose, via the correct route, and for the right duration of treatment. And antimicrobial guidelines have been associated with lots of benefits, including improvements in mortality and resistance. And there's a reference here from the BMJ if anybody would like any further reading or background on this. So this slide just shows you how important teamwork is in writing and implementing antimicrobial guidelines and policies. You need all these people, plus possibly others from your organization, sitting around the table on your antimicrobial stewardship committee to make sure that the guidelines that you write are appropriate, they're approved properly, and they're applicable to practice. And this diagram simply summarizes the process for antimicrobial guidelines. You need to write them involving all the relevant stakeholders, get them approved by the appropriate committee, disseminate them appropriately, and make sure end users are aware of them. Then when they're in place, you'll need to monitor compliance with them and ensure they're reviewed regularly to make sure they're up to date. In terms of getting started with writing antimicrobial guidelines, uh, the best place to start is to choose the most common indications. So these will likely be chest infections and UTIs, but if in doubt, the results of the global point prevalence survey may act as a guide. And then have a look if there are any national guidelines. So in Wales, we would look for any all Wales guidelines, followed on by any UK guidelines, for example, NICE guidelines or Scottish guidelines. We also look at international guidelines, so quite often IDSA guidelines or various European guidelines. And if we can't find any national or international guidelines, we then look to see if there are any other local guidelines. So from any other health boards in Wales, trusts in England, Scotland, or local guidelines from other countries. All the while, we would be considering local and national resistance patterns. And if there's absolutely no published guidelines available at all, then we would consult with specialists in that area, find out what current practice is, and then evaluate whether this is appropriate in terms of antimicrobial stewardship considerations um, and resistance patterns, and whether we could convert this into a, a guideline then. In terms of promoting the guidelines, this really is key, and it's important to ensure that all stakeholders are aware of the guidelines, including any changes to the guidelines. So you need a good process in place for doing this. They, all stakeholders need to be involved at all stages of the consultation, so invite comments and collaboration, as this will be key to making sure the clinicians own the guidelines and use the guidelines and that they're applicable to practice and relevant. They also need to be made accessible. And Zoe will come on to talk about this a little bit more um, in her section. Governance and review of the guidelines is also really important. They need to be kept up to date and there needs to be a robust system in place for this, which documents when the guideline was approved, the review date and um, the process uh, for approving the guidelines. So who approved the guideline? World Health Organization says to review the guidelines every three to five years, but in practice, um, this is often shortened. So I think most health boards in Wales would review every two, every two years. 
but also when new evidence becomes available. So horizon scanning is really important so that any national or international changes or updates are picked up and the guidelines are updated in a timely manner. So in overall summary then, um, policies are the principles that guide rational and prudent antimicrobial prescribing, whereas guidelines are recommendations for prescribing antimicrobials for specific indications. But they're both a really important part of the antimicrobial stewardship strategy. And involving the right people in writing, approving and disseminating the guidelines is absolutely key to ensuring that clinicians take them on board and use them appropriately. And now I'm going to hand over to Zoe to talk about the use of antimicrobial policies and guidelines in Wales. Thank you, Zoe. Thanks, Sham. OK, so... Um... Like Sean said, I'm going to do a small overview of um, the UK perspective um, and the way that we uh, develop and implement our antimicrobial policies and um, guidelines. So, um, as Sean mentioned, we do have a national action plan, which is a 20 year national action plan um, across the UK, and that gets broken up into five year segments. Um, we use each one of these national action plans to inform um, what we do and um, which direction our strategies are going in. So this slide also includes um, some of the logos of some of the national guideline groups that we use to um, help inform our antimicrobial um, guidelines that we use in practice as well. Next slide, please. Um, so the World Health Organization has classified um, antimicrobials into three categories. So we've got the access, watch and reserve categories. Um, now here in Wales, we've been um, tasked um, some targets by the Welsh Government to make sure that we are prescribing more than 70% across both primary and secondary care of the access aware category. So that's our narrow spectrum antibiotics. Um, and that has meant that as um, health boards and trusts, we have got to make sure that our guidelines are in line with those um, to make sure that our watch and reserve antibiotics are left um, for when we definitely need them. Next slide, please. So one of the ways um, to inform our prescribers of um, the differences in these categories is to make sure that they have a brief understanding of the um, types of antibiotics that you find in each of these categories. Um, so this is just a visual diagram that we often use in teaching sessions and in which category they're in and then we're often able to say the reason you will find some of these antibiotics um, more frequently in the guideline is because they belong to those narrow spectrum antibiotics which we are using predominantly. Next slide please. Um, so when we're writing antimicrobial guidelines it's really important that we um, follow a process for ratification and approval um, so that usually means that we would take our antimicrobial guidelines through antimicrobial stewardship committees and medicines management committees. And these are usually multidisciplinary um, committees which um, will look at the relevance and um, safety and appropriateness of these guidelines. So it's really important when you start to develop your guidelines that you make sure you have a multidisciplinary approach and you have buy-in from those people um, who are going to have the most experience and most um, interest in them uh, to make sure that they not only make it through the ratification process, but um, ultimately they will be more frequently used with that sort of approval. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to do a little poll uh, just to keep you all um, going with us. So Giles, if you could set the poll up. The idea behind this is to have a look at um, the different ways in which you can publicise a guideline. So um, we write antimicrobial guidelines and then there's a few different methods that you can use to get these guidelines out to um, your prescribers. And obviously the the more that you um, publicise them, the more likely they are um, to be followed. So we've come up with a few different options, um, things that we have used in the past and things that we've moved towards. So we've got printed paper copies on wards, websites on computers, mobile phone apps, 
electronic copy sent to your um, phone via WhatsApp, a pocketbook, an electronic copy via email, and a credit card style, which is um, a small plastic card that has some of the most frequent guidelines on it. And if you've got any other ideas that you have used or think might be more appropriate, please feel free to put those in the chat. Okay, Giles, if you could um, remove the polls so that I can keep going, please. Next slide, Sean. Thank you. Um, so I've gone through um, the three um, styles of guideline publication that I think are the most um, frequently used. So, and some of the things to think about when you're using these methods. So when you've got paper copies of antimicrobial guidelines, they are very easy to distribute and they're usually free unless they're printed physically and you have to pay for the paper and the ink. Um, the downside of them is that version control is really difficult. If you've got a guideline that's printed that um, has been updated, it's really hard to pull some of those um, old guidelines back out of circulation once they have been printed. Um, <clears throat> and um, they're not very easy for using um, calculators for dosing and monitoring. Um, the mobile phone app, which I will go into a little bit more in the next few slides, is um, the way that we've seen the UK um, progress in publicising guidelines. And majority of trusts and health boards in the UK are using one app, but we all have our own different guidelines loaded onto that mobile app. So what we found is that it's quite easy to update. Um, we can link it to national guidance and support tools, which can be found on the internet. Um, we can include calculators for dosing and monitoring, which is quite important for us because um, we are using quite a lot of gentamicin, which we use calculators for. It's very easy to distribute and um, freely available to all our prescribers. And it can be used anywhere once it's downloaded. So um, it goes with um, the prescribers. Um, the unfortunate side of it, it is a commercial app, so we do need funding for it um, and we do need internet connection to be good to get it downloaded. Um, the final option that I've looked at is um, credit card style. So this is um, the way that we used to go really before we had this app. Um, so they are, again, easy to distribute. distribute. They're small and convenient and um, can fit in people's pockets. Again, they do come with um, a bit of an expense because they need to be produced and they're usually made out of plastic. They're not easy to update. It's the same thing that you find with a paper. Once they're out there, they are really difficult to get back again. OK, next slide. So I don't know, Giles, if we can see the results of the poll. So just as a um, idea, you can see here that there's um, mobile phone app seems to be the most popular method. And that is um, what we have found here in the UK as well, um, with printed paper copies on the wards and the website on the computer um, catching up. So that's really interesting. Um, thank you very much for voting. If you could remove the poll, please, Giles. Thank you. OK, so um, the next bit I'm going to touch on is what you, should you include in your guidelines? So um, some of these things uh, might be relevant for secondary care. Some of them might be relevant for primary care or outpatient perspective. And it's thinking when you produce a guideline, um, who is this most beneficial to and what extra information might they need? So, for example, in our primary care or outpatient settings, we try and um, offer antibiotic sparing options and self-care advice for managing expectations of the clinicians to use um, if they're not going to give an antimicrobial. Next slide, please. Um, so again, this is just some ideas of um, things that we have included in some of our secondary care guidelines. So we obviously have um, antimicrobial name, dose, route, frequency. Um, but the other thing to take into consideration is, do you need second line options if you've got um, allergies? Um, any local adaptations for resistance patterns or in response to safety incidents? Um, and then differences in dosing. So we offer um, advice on renal impairment dosing and also on extremes of body weight dosing. Next slide, please. So this is just a snapshot of how our antimicrobial app looks um, when you're on a smartphone. 
And as you can see on the right hand side of the screen um, where, we've where we've got the antimicrobial options, we've also color coded those for penicillin allergies. And what we found is that one of our frequent um, complaints is that some patients with penicillin allergies um, mistakenly prescribed penicillin. So just making sure that prescribers are aware of um, what antibiotics contain penicillins and what do not. Next slide, please. Um, so again, this is just um, how it would look on a computer, so very similar, um, but we've also got the um, possibility of adding links in. So we've got links on this um, guideline for urosepsis, for um, a gentamicin calculator, and also um, for fluoroquinolone safety warnings following the MHRA um, warnings. So you can see those here. And then um, we've been able to add local adaptations. So um, enable, enable our teams to be able to get hold of community teams if they need um, supply of high cost drugs out of hours. Um, you can include telephone numbers, but it's whatever you need it to do for you. Next slide, please. Um, this is just an example of uh, one of our calculators. So um, it makes the dosing safer and we're also able um, to um, not offer a dose for patients whose renal function isn't good enough um, to have gentamicin in this scenario. Next slide, please. So one of the really difficult things when it comes to antimicrobial guidelines is making sure we balance how much information um, is provided. So you need to have enough information that your prescribers feel confident in those guidelines and have the information they need to prescribe safely. But overloading those guidelines dilute um, the importance of some of the statements um, and what we found is that not all prescribers will read all the way through they'll just go down and look for the antibiotic to prescribe so making sure you do a bit of conversation around what needs to go in there is important next slide please and then finally some of the barrier to, barriers that we've found to implementing guidelines and um, so things like availability of colleagues to form an antimicrobial guideline group um, understanding and acceptance of new guidelines being produced and how you get your prescribers to um, accept them and um, use them. Um, lack of infectious disease or microbiology specialists can make this um, difficult, but having national guidelines to fall back on is helpful. Um, getting clinicians involved from the beginning can be difficult, um, but I think we've found that it's a really valuable thing to do and it really does make the um, process much more successful and, of course, funding. Next slide, please. Um, so the final thing that we're going to talk about is auditing antimicrobial stewardship in the UK. So once you've... Um, once you've implemented some guidelines, um, it's making sure that those are being used or if there's areas where they're not being used, trying to delve a bit deeper to find out um, why. So there are some specific audits that we do across um, the UK and Wales. So we've got a point prevalence survey that we do every year in every hospital in Wales and we compare our results. Um, the Start Smart and Focus audit is a prescribing tool um, to see how prescribing is going within hospital and if antibiotics are being reviewed. Um, we do targeted audits for specific antibiotics, and these tend to be our broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, we look into our primary care um, colleagues prescribing and give them bespoke feedback on prescriptions that they've done. Any patient who has um, C. diff in most cases will get a, a review of antibiotics that they've been prescribed. And it's really making sure that if you want to implement behaviour change, um, that you align audit with feedback and education and um, keep those conversations going. Next slide, please. So thank you. That's the UK perspective from um, me and Shan. If you have any um, questions, please put them in the chat. Great. Thank you very much, Sean and Zoe, for such a, a clear description of how to go about producing some antibiotic policies and guidelines and the difference between the two. Uh, thank you very much. And remember, if, if you have got questions on any of this, please put them in the Q&A box and we will come to them at the end of the presentations. So our next presentation will give us the Egyptian perspective and it's going to be given by Professor Garda Ishmael. 
Uh, professor Ishmael is a professor of clinical microbiology and infection control and head of the microbiology unit in the Faculty of Medicine, Ain Shams University, Cairo, and head of the National IPC Guidelines Committee. And she's also a member of the World Health Organization Guidelines Development Group. So um, thank you so much for finding time to join us, Professor Ishmael, and we're looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for this nice presentation. And I will uh, share my uh, few slides to uh, show the experience of, uh, of Egypt. Uh, regarding the uh, development of Egypt National Antimicrobial Prescribing Guidelines, we started very early uh, since we have uh, the number three in place in Egypt. Uh, they have uh, joined us in the Supreme Council for University Hospitals to have a point prevalence regarding the antibiotic prescribing and utilization in Egypt. Uh, then we... Uh, we, we, we identified uh, this uh, and published uh, this uh, in a publication. Uh, as you see, it, uh, it was uh, performed in uh, uh, 19, uh, 18 university hospitals, uh, distributed uh, all through uh, Egypt. And as you see, the around in one hospital, around 100% of patients were on antibiotics. And the least hospital showed antibiotic uh, utilization was reaching 40%. When we come to the analysis, we found that our problem is in the surgical prophylaxis because uh, most of the patient undergoing surgery are uh, going on extended prophylaxis without any region. And they even in the clean surgery, they provide uh, uh, antimicrobial uh, prophylaxis. Uh, we come to work on uh, our uh, own uh, uh, selves uh, regarding the uh, surveillance of hospital acquired infection, which is a continuous monitoring surveillance digitalized on uh, mobile app. And we, we, we collected isolate, retested in a reference laboratory uh, under the cover of the Supreme Council for uh, university hospitals. Uh, I am the secretary for this um, committee and I'm the director of the uh, reference laboratory. And we collected and retested the 749 isolates in 2021. And this was uh, the analysis. We have many analysis of the data, but the most important is to show the multi-drug resistant organism percentage. And as we see, we tested for the extended spectrum beta lactamases, the CREs, uh, for Klebsiella, the most common isolate, Acinetobacter, E. coli, Pseudomonas, and uh, the, the gram positive as well. And we, we found that the coagulase negative mesocellin resistant uh, Staphylococcus aureus uh, constitute the most uh, common uh, isolate in the gram positive. Uh, in year uh, 2024, as you see, there is marvelous increase in the uh, percentage of multi-drug resistant organism, and we have the pattern uh, for distribution. Uh, we have on top priority here the Klebsiella species, which constitute the majority of the isolates, uh, uh, and followed by the Acinetobacter, then the E. coli, and but the percentage of multi-drug resistant strains in relation to the uh, total number of isolate revealed that we are, um, there is in, a trend for increase and we are about to have a crisis of this multi-drug resistant organism. So we, uh, as you see here, there is uh, the, the rise all over the four, last four years. Uh, we have the steps followed to develop national guidelines for antimicrobial utilization. We have a steering committee uh, for the infection prevention uh, control and preventive affairs in the Supreme Council, which uh, govern around 120 hospital, university hospitals. 
And we communicated with the Ministry of Health uh, because it is uh, working on 35% uh, uh, of hospitals in Egypt and also the uh, hospital in, uh, health insurance uh, healthcare sector, which become increasingly because we are going to have uh, uh, health insurance. Uh, after formulation of this steering committee, we developed, uh, we have the uh, task force committee for developing the guideline. We revised the resistance pattern originated from the 45 uh, labor microbiology laboratory because microbiology laboratories in university hospitals experience advanced techniques, automation, and uh, having the uh, Clinical Laboratory Standard Institute and new United Kingdom guidelines, and they have quality control, and we have double testing of the isolates. Uh, then we have management of conflict of interest. We have uh, developed key questions and outcomes distributed to the panel of experts. Then we, uh, we, we don't have uh, the grading of evidence, but we are working to improve our guidelines. Uh, then uh, we have uh, nowadays uh, the um, Egypt High Council for Health. The Egypt High Council for Health is working on uh, uh, clinical guidelines by law. Uh, these guidelines, seven guidelines and national antimicrobial formulary were developed. We started by antimicrobial uh, surgical prophylaxis non-surgical prophylaxis, empirical, we have the double guideline switching from antibiotic from intravenous to oral, and we have an antifungal guideline as well, the drug formulary and uh, the pre-authorization and restriction forms uh, development. Uh, we are stuck now, uh, and this is the... Uh, trends uh, and uh, um, for the hospital acquired infection, because when we start to implement the uh, uh, formulation on the antimicrobial stewardship group, and we have a professor of surgery and professor of critical medicine, they afraid that when they try to, um, to enforce the implementation, uh, there will be a resistance from the clinician because they were afraid that we have a rise in the uh, uh, hospital acquired infection and the surgical site infection rate. That's why we uh, uh, monitor the application and have the rate to be sent to them. Uh, they have the user and uh, password to have their to retrieve the uh, these results on the level of each hospital in the infection control and uh, department. And they will show it monthly on their uh, meetings. Sorry. Uh, nowadays, we are on the step of uh, formulating a skeleton for the antimicrobial uh, stewardship in the form of committee and team in the uh, each hospital. Uh, of course, there are some uh, sporadic efforts because we distributed the guidelines for their feedback. Um, some worked on the antimicrobial prophylaxis uh, and um, they are uh, successful in this uh, manner. But now uh, still we are not implementing the full plumb picture of stewardship in the old university hospitals. But uh, we're uh, under we're with your support uh, because I have uh, to ask support for some points uh, regarding the calculation uh, the calculator mentioned in the previous lecture and others. And thank you for allowing me uh, to have this presentation uh, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ishmael, for presenting that very interesting data from Egypt. Um, I'm sure there'll be uh, more discussion about that at the end. Thank you very much. Thank so you. So our, our final presentation uh, for today will uh, give us the Indian perspective from Dr. Sangeeta Joshi. Uh, Dr. Joshi is a consultant medical microbiologist who's worked at corporate hospitals in Delhi, Mumbai and Bangalore in India. 
and she's been the quality auditor for the Manipal Group of Hospitals and been on the World Health Organization assignments as a faculty for WhoNet training. So we're looking forward very much to hearing from India. Thank you very much, Dr. Joshi. Thank you, Angra, and a very good day to all of you. Um, I'll just share my slides. So a good, very good day to all of you, and I thank the Royal College for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this webinar. I will be presenting the Indian viewpoint on developing prescribing guidelines. But before I go into the topic, a br brief overview of what we have in India in, as the healthcare. We have primary healthcare centers in rural areas, just consisting of a doctor, a secondary healthcare at the sub-district levels, which have hospitals with a few basic medical specialities and a basic laboratory and the tertiary healthcare in the district headquarters, towns where you have district hospitals, government hospitals, and private hospitals. Regarding the microbiology laboratory facilities, these are seen in the tertiary centers in central government institutes like Ames, state government hospitals, medical colleges, private hospitals, and we do have a lot of standalone laboratories which provide microbiology facilities. Currently, we have the national guidelines available in India. The latest one is from the Indian Council of Medical Research, ICMR. So these are the guidelines for common syndromes. We also have the National Center for Disease Control, NCTC guidelines, which include surgical antibiotic prophylaxis. And as latest, as June 24, we have the consensus statement for CRE management and tuberculosis treatment guidelines. This is just a brief um, look at the treatment guidelines from ICMR, the second edition, which came out in 2022, available as app-based form, as was shown earlier, for the common syndromes. The ICMR guidelines were made by the anti using the antimicrobial susceptibility data from selected leading tertiary care hospitals in India, and they do not represent the community data. Antimicrobial resistance data, as we are all familiar with, is different in different regions, different hospitals of the same region, and different wards of the same hospital. So it is essential to make your own antibiogram depending upon the hospital and the ward. To give you an idea about the diversity in India, think of the distance of one and a half times between UK and Greece. That is approximately the north-south distance in India, traversing hills, plateaus, plains, and coastal areas. This study in India done around 11 years back on MRSA from 21 centers all over India showed that the MRSA rate varied from 22% in the south to 68% in the east. And even now, there is a scarcity of AMR data at the national level. So in spite of having the national guidelines, I will just go through how each hospital prepares its hospital-specific antibiotic prescribing guidelines, like what I have been doing in my hospitals. So that would involve preparation of the antibiogram, risk stratification of the patients, and then developing the empiric antibiotic guidelines with the respective stakeholders. We use the CLSI M39 for preparation of the antibiogram, and most Government hospitals and pri some private hospitals use the WHO free software, the WHONET software, to get the antibiogram. However, some hospitals also have their own software to develop the antibiograms. The data is acquired in the WHONET either by a manual entry because some hospitals or colleges still use this diffusion. Those who use automated, semi-automated systems or lab information system input the data directly into the HONET. We then prepare the antibiogram as location-specific, ICU wards and outpatients, age-specific, source-specific, blood, urine, respiratory samples, and so on, organism-specific. And at least the antibiogram is prepared yearly. In large volume centers, we used to make it six-monthly. To give you an example of salmonella, it is monsoon time here in India. Along with monsoons come enteric fever, which is primarily caused by typh salmonella typhi and para A. And a look at the organism-specific antibiograms shows zero percentage susceptibility to the fluoroquinolones. And in accordance with this, the ICMR prescribing guidelines for enteric fever suggest the use of cotrimoxazole or azithromycin 
as the initial treatment for enteric fever or an alternative being cefixime, and then based on the culture results, if required, to be changed. This is uh, what I mentioned about location-specific and source-specific antibiogram. This is the urine from an outpatient showing the top five organisms being as expected, E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterococcus, Pseudomonas. And we make the antibiogram for the top four organisms based on OP, outpatients, inpatients, and ICU. And how do we put it as an antibiotic policy? It would depend upon the patient risk stratification. We stratify our patients as type 1 who have no healthcare contact, no procedures, no antibiotic history in the past 90 days. They're usually young with no com comorbid conditions. And we do expect a pathogen which is susceptible to common narrow spectrum antibiotics. A type 2 patient would have had <clears throat> healthcare contact, uh, antibiotic history, and they may be elderly with a few comorbid conditions where we would expect ESBLs and MRSA. And a type 3 patient would be a person with a prolonged healthcare contact with major invasive procedures, immunosuppressed, where we would even expect a CRE. All criteria need to be present before we classify a patient as type 1, and any one criteria would put the patient in type 2 or type 3. So using these two, the antibiogram and the patient risk type, for the MPRI guidelines for UTI and OPD, we would frame it as nitrofurantoin and cotrimoxazolfra, Type 1 patient, type 2 would remain the same and wait for the culture results. Whereas for a type 3 patient, we would like to admit the patient and start on beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations. Similarly, for respiratory infections, pneumonia and the ICU, although the antibiogram showed us acinitoclepsilla and pseudo as the top organisms, if a patient came in from the community and was admitted with pneumonia in the ICU, we would continue with ceftriaxone and azithromycin. Whereas for a type 2 patient, move on to beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitors and carbapenems for type 3. So based on these two, a discussion, as mentioned earlier, with all stakeholders, because they have to own this antibiotic guidelines to make specific prescription guidelines regarding the dosage and the duration is made. These guidelines are available to the junior most doctor and all the faculty, either as a booklet, a pocket handbook, or at every nursing station computer, or as a soft copy. And there is a, the decision to escalate or de-escalate would be taken after the culture results. These guidelines are aligned with the ICMR national guidelines, or even international like IDSA guidelines for, say, candidemia. Currently, what we have in India, the guidelines, antibiotic guidelines are available from the AIMS hospitals, New Delhi, Mangalagiri, Jodhpur, Bhopal, etc., and Christian Medical College hospitals, state government hospitals in Mumbai. State, some states have their own antibiotic guidelines and a large number of private and corporate hospitals. I'm just giving you a snapshot. There are many, many hospitals where these are available. The Manipal Group, the Apollo, Hinduja Hospital, Mumbai, and Sir Gangaram Hospital, Delhi, where uh, I was lucky to have been a part of this in 2003-04, where we brought out one of the early hospitals to bring out the empiric antibiotic guidelines. In India, what are the challenges we face in developing prescribing guidelines? One is the lack of microbiology laboratory facilities at the secondary healthcare level. There is a scarcity of AMR data, even in some tertiary care facilities. There is difficulties in antibiogram preparation, especially where, which involves manual entry. There may be a shortage of staff or a limited use of technology. And the limited number of infectious disease specialists who actually spearhead the stewardship program. The way ahead, as we see it, WHO has established AMR surveillance networks in three states, which are doing very well, where they train uh, the HUNET software and also they uh, to prepare the help in preparation of the antibiogram. This is done in collaboration with the state government, state medical college, NCDC, and donors. And six more states are in the pipeline from WHO and six more states from NCDC are going to be part of the AMR surveillance networks. Many corporate private hospitals go in for accreditation and our accreditation body, National NABH, one of the standards includes the preparation of an antibiogram and an antibiotic policy, which has really helped in establishing these, especially in the private sector. 
The way ahead would also include dissemination of these national treatment guidelines at the primary and secondary healthcare levels, establishment of microbiology facilities at least at the secondary healthcare levels, and encouraging the preparation of antibiogram, however small the center is, by training in HUNET or the other softwares. These are a few of my references, and I thank you for a patient hearing. Thank you very much, Dr. Joshi, for that really interesting presentation and interesting to see some common themes coming through that other speakers have also touched on and that perhaps we can explore a little bit more in, in a minute when we have uh, the Q&A. Um, do, if you have got any questions, do please put them in the Q&A box. Um, just before we start on that, I know that the international team would like to share a poll asking you to um, enter the country that you're dialing in from, because this is the only way that we have to capture this information. So if you'd be willing to uh, quickly write your uh, country in, in that poll, then that would be really helpful for us. Otherwise, we don't actually uh, know uh, the, the range of countries that our audience has attended from. So I'll just give you a few seconds to do that. And then if you have some questions, do please enter them in the chat. Right, I'm going to uh, go on to the uh, panel now. I have a, a few uh, things that I thought it would be interesting to explore. Um, Sean and Zoe, uh, you mentioned getting buy-in from clinicians. Um, can, can you... Could you elaborate a little bit more on how we can get clinicians on board to actually use these guidelines? Because that seems to be a, a, one of the biggest challenges with, with this whole topic. Yeah, I think I think it is. And if you can get it right, it really works. So from my perspective in my hospital so I work in a in a district general hospital and we've got three acute hospitals in the health board and when we do our specialty guidelines we always try and get a clinician in our working group from the very beginning so we've for example um we've done recently the obs and gynae guidelines so we've got an obstetrician to come and sit with us um, we start with a very small group of us, so a couple of microbiologists, few antimicrobial pharmacists, and then um, the specialist, or sometimes we've been lucky enough to have two specialists there. Um, and then what you find is you learn an awful lot because you see things from their, their perspective as well, the clinical perspective, not just the um, antimicrobial perspective. They're also aware of other guidelines that maybe we wouldn't have um, considered. But I think not not just their um, their experience and their input in that way, it's their links with their colleagues as well. So by writing the guidelines with, the, with them involved and then them helping us to almost sort of sell them to their peers, um, that really has been has been key. I don't know if Zoe wants to add anything to that, but I don't think I can emphasize enough ha how important it is and how much easier as well it makes the, makes the whole process. Um, I think there's two different ways to approach it as well. So um, trying to get a clinician on board, you can either go with someone you know is going to be enthusiastic and they'll probably bring something to you and want you to help develop a guideline in that area. But the other way that we've done it is... Um, Sometimes you'll have prescribers who are really difficult um, to deal with or never comply to guidelines. And they, um, if you go to them and say, oh, I just can't understand why why we can't get people to prescribe this way. Um, sometimes you can get them on board to come and discuss the evidence. And that way you tackle two things at once, non-compliance to guidelines and also um, getting those top level clinicians on board. So I found that a really useful way to um, get people's buy-in. Yeah, that sounds like a good strategy as well and, and involves a, a sort of education for everybody really to learn more about the topic and then discuss it again. Um, Professor Ishmael, have, have you got any any ways, have you had difficulty? I guess that this is a, an international problem to get um, people to buy into guidelines. So is, is that a common problem in Egypt as well? 
yes, we suffer a lot from this. Uh, even my husband is a uh, head of department of uh, surgery. Uh, uh, he prescribed for endocrine surgery, he prescribed the antibiotics for prophylaxis in clean operations of thyroidectomy. I tried to convince him not to use this. Uh, this is very really difficult. And other surgeons, when you come to pediatric uh, surgeon, uh, they refuse to follow because they said uh, the uh, antibiotic prophylaxis for not using in clean surgery, this must be in very clean atmosphere, uh, the patient coming without any uh, uh, colonization. The, so uh, we that, that's why we uh, developed the uh, mobile application for hospital acquired infection and make them um, uh, see the uh, results on a dashboard, uh, but still we are in stuck in the area of prophylaxis. We distributed the guideline for empirical, but we are still uh, don't have um, a strong uh, antimicrobial stewardship uh, members or uh, implementer uh, in the the hospitals. We have key performance indicators. Uh, we have infection control program, but we suffer like this when we started the infection control program. But nowadays we have a well-established infection control programs with uh, uh, IPC key performance indicators. We hope that with persistence, we will have uh, implementation of antimicrobial stewardship. Uh, I wish to ask your assistance in uh, uh, how to have these calculators for the dose for the uh, uh, the to perform the uh, fine prevalence survey to have the costing of antibiotic utilization because we started to do this uh, all these uh, activities or task uh, tasks but still uh, I just want to have a peer reviewing or. Uh, from uh, your experience. Yeah, Thank uh, you. How, did, how did you go about embedding that calculator? Is is that a very technical thing to do or was, or was it something that the pharmacist team could quite easily do? Uh, yes, because we don't have uh, uh, the clinical pharmacist. We, we changed the um, uh, curriculum for pharmacists because before they, ha they are uh, four years, without any house officer uh, year, we don't have, uh, nowadays we have new uh, certificate for pharmacists, all are uh, six years and they have one year to work in the hospitals. This uh, program was started this academic year, next academic year from next September. So we have shortage of clinical pharmacists to adjust the dosing, to have, uh, uh, that's why we 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 don't implement uh, all uh, all tasks of the uh, stewardship. Yes, of course, it's, it's not possible to do everything all at once. I'm sure. Uh, you mentioned your high rate of um, inappropriate surgical prophylaxis uh, yes. in your presentation as well, and even introducing guidelines hasn't really addressed that. It hasn't had the desired effect so far. Uh, we, we didn't measure the compliance okay. yet, but right. uh, the slide I showed that uh, the, the, the published data uh, done uh, to, uh, to have the priority of our problems in the anti, uh, antimicrobial utilization, our prescription, uh, then we, we will have a measurement uh, right. by the so end year, uh, for yeah. uh, the uh, planning because uh, I think we, we worked also on switching from the intravenous to oral as well uh, in uh, pilot uh, sites. And it is uh, this point is successful and we don't face uh, that much resistance uh, like uh, stop prophylaxis, uh, like uh, having to stick to the guidelines. Uh, we experienced some shortage of uh, some antibiotics uh, in the previous uh, time due to uh, flotation of the Egypt uh, uh, Egyptian pounds. Uh, but uh, I think the, con the situation will be better in the upcoming uh, months and we will uh, 
have our measurement and feedback corrective action on the plan. So it would be very interesting to see the impact of that. Um, Dr. Joshi, um, how, what's your approach for managing behaviour change? Because that's what a lot of this is about, isn't it? And um, really a, a difficult social science, really. So uh, what, what strategies have you found to be useful? The strategies more or less remain the same as including all the stakeholders while preparing the guidelines. But in spite of that, we have a mixed bag. And uh, what we've seen is the pediatricians more or less are very worried, I would say, and they stick to the guidelines for their uh, babies. And the surgeons, yes, are a little diffi more difficult to tackle. But uh, even there, a certain um, the dosage and the appropriateness would be there, but it's the duration which we are still trying to convince them to reduce the duration from whatever they're practicing. Physicians more or less are compliant and the critical care team is quite uh, compliant, but the problems we face is in the duration mm. of this. Uh, Would you say that's a, a common thing for the UK as well, Sean, the duration of, of the treatment? Yeah, I, I'd say that surgical prophylaxis is still something that we struggle with in some areas and um we do various things and seem to get on top of it for a bit and then it and then it slips and slides so yeah it's uh yeah i would agree it's it's i think it's always going to be an area to tackle um i think we've seen some changes in primary care recently with um durations being shortened in national guidelines and i think that's going to be a really difficult area to make sure that we get compliance with those duration reductions and it's for things like respiratory tract infections which we've seen a huge prevalence of over the last few years um so it's not just surgeons it's everywhere in some scenarios because everybody just wants the best for their patients and sometimes giving more antibiotics does seem like that's yes yeah the easier thing to do yeah um dr joshi we have a question from dr aya which i think may be directed to you uh because i think it relates to one of your uh slides how does one offer azithromycin to patients with salmonellosis and shigellosis we've started seeing azithromycin resistance in shigella yes <laughs> um shigella i have not seen any azithro resistance but uh salmonella in Typhi, we did have a very few cases, not too many to be really alarmed about. And then we would, uh, if it is an outpatient treatment, shift to oral um, third generation cephalosporins. But in Shigella, probably he would have to go to the higher antibiotic. And I haven't seen a lot of Shigella, frankly, because in Bangalore and wherever I worked, we, we did see cholera, but not Shigella. And uh, we were just discussing last week and he was telling me about the, the amount of, this is monsoon season, so we do expect to see salmonella and shigella and cholera in our country, and that's what he was overwhelmed with, and he was asking me if I had seen it. No, so probably move on to the higher, uh, you know, even BLBLIs or even carbapenems in those cases. Thank you, thank you. Um, Sean, at the, near the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that guidelines have been demonstrated to lead to improvement in mortality. That was... Can you elaborate on that evidence? Um, because that sounds like something also really useful to present to, to people to convince them that guidelines are a good thing to have. Yeah, so, so it's basically, I suppose the guidelines are the appropriate empirical choice. So we're, we're, we're given the right treatment for the infection. So the mortality benefit is that we're treating the infection properly. But then also because we're using narrower spectrum antibiotics, there's benefits in terms of mortality due to resistant infections and resistance in the future and also due to um, infections such as C. diff and adverse effects of antibiotics. So multifactorial yeah. benefits, really. Do, do we have hard evidence of the impact of guidelines on, on mortality? Does that exist? I don't know. I don't know if any of the other panelists have that information to hand, but I I don't have it uh, to hand myself. But I can I can certainly look into that. 
yeah I just wondered if that because you put a link there from the BMJ yes. I wondered if that's what so there may be there may well be something in there I'd need to sort of re-familiarize myself with that reference but um I can have a look at that interesting thank you and uh Professor Ishmael I noticed on one of your slides that you you pointed out that the I think that the trend of ICU infections and device associated infections was going downwards very successfully. Um, what do you attribute that success to? Uh, uh, it's just a, a logo to uh, to motivate to motivate or uh, be thankful to infection control teams because yeah. they have uh, uh, performing capacity building and uh, training on the aseptic techniques and uh, they follow uh, the uh, insertion of cannula, the, the, UT, uh, the urinary catheters, uh, and also they uh, come to the ventilators, uh, how to, to clean it, the, to ensure that the filters are changed every five days as we recommend. A lot of work done by the infection control teams uh, so the uh, infection rate become uh, a little bit decreased and hope we sustain this uh, improvement. Uh, but this is because we transcend the infection control program and we target the device associated infection as we found that it is the, one of the our main, uh, it, uh, when you come to compare the device associated and relation to the non-device associated, you find it constitute the majority. That's why we focus on uh, on this in our infection control uh, plan. Well, it, it was great to see that impact demonstrated so clearly in, in the data. Uh, but this is uh, cumulative data from all hospitals. Uh, right. We have uh, this data show on the level of uh, each ICU, on the level of each hospital, and it, on the level of each university. Then this is the cumulative data on the level of the Supreme Council. Um, they, they, there will be uh, some hospitals showing great improvement and others are not good. But the cumulative data uh, showed the improvement mm. for uh, all the rates. Very positive. Yes. So uh, we don't seem to have any more questions from the audience. So I'm going to um, thank the panelists very, very much for their presentations and uh, contributions to the discussion and I will come back to that at the end but I'm just going to reshare my slides and um, just give a little bit of information about the recordings that you'll be able to access so all of the webinars in this series are recorded and they will be on the website in the international regions section under the virtual resources category uh, we aim to upload the recordings to the website two weeks after each webinar. So this one should be up in two weeks. Our final webinar in this series will be next week on the 12th of July, which is Friday, the slightly later time of day of uh, 12 o'clock British summer time or noon British summer time, which is later than the other webinars have been and we will be looking at evaluating an antimicrobial stewardship program what are the measures of success uh, here's the link which you can also find on the website we'll be hearing from Dr David Jenkins until recently president of the British Society for Antimicrobial Chemotherapy and a previous chair of RC Paths Medical Microbiology Specialist Advisory Committee as well as representatives from Canada Egypt and Hong Kong you may also be interested in uh, the programme that the international team is uh, preparing for International Pathology Day on the 6th of November, uh, which will have the theme of antimicrobial resistance as well. So you may be interested to register for that event in November, which you can also do via the website. There will be a brief feedback form after the webinar. We would uh, really appreciate uh, if you had a couple of minutes that you could spend filling that in and completing it. It will be completely anonymous. Lastly, I want to thank our contributors, Sean Price, Zoe Kennelly, 
Professor Ishmael and Dr. Joshi for their uh, really interesting and clear presentations and for providing insights into all your respective countries. And as ever to the international teams, uh, Giles Han Han Hanratty, who's worked uh, so hard behind the scenes to bring this series to you. And thank you to everyone who's attended. Uh, we hope to see you in the final webinar. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.